see what that means. So liberal arts in the 21st century. So although the idea of a liberal arts was um, is very old and originated back in ancient Greece and Rome, um, I think that it's very applicable today to like what uh, our college experiences as well. So uh, the liberal arts uh, aims to develop leaders who are globally aware, conscious of the greater consequences of their actions, learn to recognize patterns of history and the big picture of society, who are innovative thinkers in the humanities and STEM. So. These are people who aren't so like narrowly focused on what they're learning in college, necessarily like their major necessarily, but people who can see beyond the consequence, like beyond what they're learning right now, to, like greater consequences of what their actions might have in the future. And they're also innovative thinkers, so they can think outside the box. They can draw connections to all different fields, and uh, uh, both in the humanities and STEM. So connecting the practical and the philosophical. And uh, I'd like to make a distinction too between liberal education and the liberal arts colleges. So liberal education is the whole idea, the philosophy of education that a lot of colleges are grounded in. A lot of colleges actually like uh, Ivy League colleges, Stanford, I know which has a lot of like, um, like the CS and human Humanities program which combined that. U Chicago, which has a really great core program. Princeton, Yale, they also were founded in the will do a bunch of reading and talk about um, the material. And they have some first year seminars which are very interdisciplinary, so covering a bunch of different fields. And I'll introduce a couple of them that Pomona offers later. Um, advisor letters. So uh, the first year that you go to college, you're going to have an advisor usually who will help you choose classes and determine your future. And um, so I think for a lot of large universities, when you go to uh, choose classes. You get uh, you, you, you register for an appointment and you sit there and you just talk about classes. But for Pomona, um, before for our pre-enrollment <coughs> materials, um, for advisor letters, I had to write a really really long letter of about like two or three pages detailing my ambitions and my future ideas about college and like, who I want to be when I um, grow up and like all that kind of stuff. And the people who match you to your faculty advisor, they sit there and they read 400 letters and they personally decide um, what member of the faculty is best for your interests, who can assist you both professionally, academically, and also personally in your growth at college. So they're very intentionable, intentional about uh, doing that like personally. Um, Pomona sponsor groups. So this is something unique to Pomona, but I think it also emphasizes the highly personal approach they have to um, college. So a lot of colleges, they just randomly match you with people. Um, some colleges have like a really brief form you might fill out for your roommates. Pomona sponsor group is, uh, um, so basically, uh, instead of randomly matching you or having you choose your own uh, roommates, they give you a really long form to fill out about a slow, 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 okay. It's okay, I actually think it's very disturbing. Okay. Oh, okay, so Pomona sponsor groups for your, um, Hallmates, people who live with you, uh, they you, you fill out a really long letter about your interests, your personality, your background, who you are, your like music preferences, your favorite, whatever. Um, and they personally read through those 400 letters too and match you with a group of students who they think you can um, learn best from and who will also be compatible with you in terms of personality. And from what I've heard last year, like my friend who went to Pomona, she said like this is they do such a good job of doing that. And it's like an inbuilt friend group when you first get there, so they like assist you socially. And it's um, yeah, a testament to how highly personal Pomona's approach to colleges is. And finally, it forces you to develop strong communicative abilities. So instead of uh, having like huge lecture halls and like huge um, introductory classes where you're just like somebody sitting at the back of a lecture hall listening to a professor talk, they want you to engage in your academic experience. So. Um, in classes like your first year seminar, or even in labs, and like uh, these classes, which like have a lot of, are a lot smaller than they are at large universities, they make you talk to your fellow students and talk to your professors and um, communicate your ideas. So from the very beginning, freshman year, they want you to develop strong communicative abilities. Um, at Pomona, they invite all the uh, first year students to uh, dinner at the president's house, and they often have students like go to like lunch or dinner with their professors and have that sort of um, experience of talking with adults and your peers alike. So they emphasize that a lot. And finally, uh, interdisciplinary. So uh, liberal, 
arts colleges have this interdisciplinary focus, but also I think it's a hallmark of liberal education in general. So it's not just liberal arts colleges. Liberal education emphasizes that you don't have, like they don't want you to be so like narrowly focused in one field of um, study. They want you to be uh, well versed in many different fields like across humanities and STEM. So like a computer science student, for example, who's really good at communicating verbally and artistically, they can go much farther than somebody who's just like sitting at a desk programming all day. And um, like an econ student who's like well versed in like psychology and like history can understand the greater patterns of like what they're learning and how to apply that later on. So they have a lot of classes that make um, they make you take classes in many different fields. So um, I know Columbia has something like this, like their core uh, education curriculum. They make you read a bunch of books and like see how that applies to your education later. So it's very interdisciplinary. So that their students can understand where they came from and um, where society is heading and like have a bigger pic big, bigger picture of like what their education is all about. So a couple of facts. So um, according to uh, a Northwestern professor did a study uh, in a thinking student's guide to colleges. He said that college professors are actually twice as likely to send their children to liberal arts colleges than parents of a similar educational and socioeconomic group. Um, this means that, because a lot of college professors, they know exactly what's going on in the whole um, field of education, and they're actually twice as likely to send their children, um, which is, I guess, it, I think it said something about um, what liberal arts colleges offer. Uh, they know that they emphasize teaching more instead of having to focus on research, and um, students get a more personal approach. But of course, like, it's all up to the student, too. Like, every student has their own needs. Um, so, uh, he also reported that 62% of liberal arts college students felt that faculty took a genuine interest in them compared to 36% for public research universities and 41% for private. So because um, liberal arts colleges are very teaching focused and not research focused necessarily like as much like relatively, um, liberal arts colleges students report that like faculty like are genuinely interested in what like who they are and like their personal ambitions instead of just like I don't know pushing them through the like education process. So they want to sit down with them and talk about who they are. So as I said earlier, like the first year seminar courses, I think at Pomona, they're really interesting. So I'll just give you a couple examples of what we get to choose from um, for first year seminars. So they have one called I Disagree, so they're talking about, this seminar is about like the issue of disagreement and how do we work with differences in opinion in our like, engagement with society and in our personal lives. So how do we disagree with people? Is disagreement um, bad, is bad thing or is it a healthy thing? Uh, how do we compromise and how can we deal with that in our future lives? So they have a seminar about that. It's really popular from what I've heard among um, the students. They have one called Gaming the News. And so they want to study like, the news industry and how th what that's all about and how media uh, portrays like the, um, current events and all that. So if you've heard of like Stephen Colbert and like John Stewart and like the, all that and Newsroom House of Cards, they want to study like um, satire in news and what the news industry is all about. They have one called Science in the Public Health. So. Um, they talk about the interaction between uh, society and public policy and science. And so they just want to study the philosophical, ethical, and uh, scientific consequences of innovations such as the chlorofluorocarbons and like the tetraethyl lead additives. So it's, um, well, they want to tie in like um, scientific advancements with like learning about philosophical and um, ethical consequences of that. So the humanities and science together. And finally, they have one called Tripping the Light Fantastic, which has been one um, on the uh, course catalog for many years because it's so popular. They study history, gender roles, colonialism, society, and religion through ballroom dancing. So they have st they go to like ballroom dancing, uh, like other ballroom dancing events, and they want to learn like history and religion, especially like, through ballroom dancing. So it's a really fascinating course. And yeah. Okay, part two. Uh, meet me and the liberal arts colleges. So I'll introduce a little bit about me and my story and a little bit about why I thought a couple of liberal arts colleges that interested me and why I applied to them. So, okay, I'll talk a little bit about me first. I, when I attended um, King's Academy as a sixth grader, I was really shy and really introverted. I was worried about having no friends and I didn't have many, very many friends for the first couple years I was at King's. Um, but I always really admired a lot of like upperclassmen and I was always like, you know, I want to be them, like I wish I was them. Um, but 
I was like, you know, I'm not somebody who's a leader. Like, I'm not somebody who can start clubs and like do all like what they're doing. So, a huge part of my journey at Kings was learning how to be comfortable with myself and not wanting to be somebody else while I challenge myself to be the best person I could be. So, um, I recognized early on from the time I was really little that I loved reading, and I always spent a lot of time in the library and. Um, Oh, I put a lot into like my English projects. I love writing too. I won a couple of writing competitions when I was in elementary school, and so I was like really into that. And so uh, I was really close to my seventh grade English teacher and my ninth grade English teacher, and they were really like huge inspirations to me in terms of what I want to do. And because of that, because of my small school like environment, and because of the like intimacy of like teacher-student interactions there, I was really encouraged by teachers and, and developing myself. And even throughout high school, like when I was really busy, I always made time for what I love to do, which is reading and writing. And uh, I'll talk a little bit more about that later. But um, so I always like um, every year I like set out a couple of books I wanted to read and make sure I got that done because it always like grounded me and like um, showed me what I wanted to do. So I think in high school it was a combination of recognition by peers who started to ask me for help in like English essays. And um, I joined debate as well, so I got a little bit of experience with public speaking. I quit debate in 10th grade, but um, I think it really helped me like learn how to communicate with other people. And um, that got me to start on the path of who I am now, and like learning how to not be like so shy and introverted, and starting clubs and having uh, stepping up to like a more leadership position. But of course, I never got to be that person who I always um, necessarily like saw, and I was like, you know, I'm not. I'm not always going to be that like insanely social person or that person who's like the school president or whatever. And you have to like learn how to, I guess, like know who you are and how to develop in your own way. Um, but in class, I was uh, especially in high school. I started speaking up a lot more in class and uh, asking questions and not being afraid about that. And I remember once in tenth grade history class, uh, we we're just like talking. And I was always a shy Asian girl who sat in the back of class. And we had this debate one day and I just stood up there and I was like, started talking, they're like, what the heck, what are you doing? Like, mm -hmm. how is this girl like suddenly so like aggressive? But um, so I think I continued that throughout high school and I was always really willing to um, speak up and uh, take initiative in that. And I was always willing to have conversations with people as much as possible, to try to be honest and authentic and treat myself as, as much as possible. So I think people saw that and um, I became a leader in that way, even though I wasn't like traditionally like socially egregious or whatever. Um, I talked a lot with teachers in high school. I would often go out to lunch with them or like um, stay after class and I'll mention that later. Like a lot of them became uh, really great mentors to me, like both personally and academically. Uh, okay, also one thing that, um, so okay. I had a really, uh, I had a lot of strong opinions too about my um, academic journey. So I was involved in orchestra and I started being involved in 10th grade. And um, because our school is so small, a lot of times uh, we would have scheduled conflicts with like orchestra and like AP classes because they have only like one or two sections of AP classes because there weren't that many people who wanted to take them. So in 10th grade, I found a lot of my really close friends through orchestra and I would travel around like the state, California, um, to like Sacramento and like LA, like performing with the choirs because I was a accompanist and uh, with my orchestra friends in competitions. And so in the beginning of junior year, I found out that my um, orchestra class actually conflicted with the AP Calculus class, because they only had one AP Calculus class. That's how, that's how my school was like. So I could either drop orchestra and take AP Calculus, or um, drop AP Calculus and like, do orchestra. And I was actually then in the running for being valedictorian or salutatorian. I had like one of the highest GPAs back then. So um, the college counselor was like, well, if you drop orchestra, if you drop orchestra and take AP calculus, you can probably like maintain that. But if you take orchestra, you're probably gonna drop in your rankings because that's how it is. And um, they were all like, "Well, obviously you should like drop orchestra because like you can you can be salutatorian and auditorium if you do that." But I was like, "I, I want to take orchestra because that's who, what I found my um, joy from, enjoyment from. It was like a really great way for me to like express my passion through music. I play piano." And they were all really aghast that I would do that, but I um, continue. I like stood firm in my opinions, and so I proved to them that uh, I took a uh, AP calculus class outside of school that year. So I took orchestra, I dropped AP calculus, and I studied on my own and got a five on AP calc. And 
So yeah, they were really surprised that I would do that. But I think it's important to like stand firm in what like you love to do instead of like going on a traditional route of like taking a bunch of classes just because you have to. Um, I also developed a lot of supportive friendships in um, my school. A lot of people who could uh, like collaborate with me in terms of academics. And these people would like be able to talk to me about like intellectual topics as well. And um, so for example, in the beginning of uh, 12th grade when we were all applying for colleges, I know a lot of schools have people who like um, get really like jealous of each other and it's like really, like it breaks a lot of friendships when people are applying to colleges. My friends and I, even though we were applying to a lot of the same schools, we would sit down and like edit each other's essays and like we'd always help each other with tests and um, competition wasn't really strong at our school. It was, like, more, it was a very collaborative environment and I'm really, really grateful to Kings for that because I never like lost any friends over the college apps process. And that's also another huge reason why I sought out a uh, um, liberal arts college environment, because a lot of them are uh, very collaborative in terms of like um, how students work together. They're not very competitive. And I think it depends on a student too. Some people like a more competitive environment. Some people like a more um, what I like. I'll, I really um, owe a lot to my friends in that. And I also challenged myself as much as possible with course selection. So um, AP Chemistry this year. AP Chemistry is the hardest course at our school, for our school, and I know that if I took AP Biology, I'd probably also have a higher GPA because of that, but I challenged myself as much as possible because I really loved the professor that taught that class, and um, I think that helped me too because my college counselors would write that like, sh I did as much as possible with my academics. All right, so I'll just briefly talk about my extracurricular activities. Um, I founded the school literary magazine in 10th grade, and I was the editor-in-chief for three years, so this is something I found really difficult, actually, because I don't, I don't like to take the initiative in terms of like starting clubs and like getting people to come to all meetings and stuff. I find it difficult. But uh, through the encouragement of my ninth grade English teacher, so my ninth grade English teacher was like a brilliant, brilliant man. He only came to our school for one year, and then he moved to Wisconsin. Um, he moved back to Wisconsin. So um, I would always keep in touch with him so sophomore year, and he's the. Um, He's a main advisor for his school magazine and newspaper. So he was really encouraging me to start one at my own school because we didn't have one at King's. And uh, I also sought the advice and help of my seventh grade English teacher, who was also my, who's also the English department head, actually, and um, Mrs. Hayward, who is the PR director at our school. So I think through the experience of doing the literary magazine, I received so much like encouragement from my school teachers and advisors and I really got an experience about uh, with that. So I think it was a valuable experience. And it's like leadership too, of course. Um, I was also very heavily involved with my school visual performing arts program. Since um, there's like no pianist at our school actually, I'm like one of only three in our grade or something like that, but uh, we're like classically trained. I was the accompanist for choir, for orchestra, um, and for theater programs. I won a couple of state ensemble awards and I was also the worship leader because we go to a Christian school. and. Uh, I think um, I invested a lot of my time in that. So I would spend a lot of weekends like down in LA and like Sacramento like for competitions. And I think, of course it interfered with my grades like somewhat. Like, it, I mean, do study hard, but like I think it, it really helped me out a lot. Like, cause it was a huge passion of mine. So I was heavily involved in that. Um, and finally, I went on a couple mission trips with my school to like LA, Mexico and the Philippines. Is a big school thing, so it was like a couple of service opportunities. And in the summer, for most of my summers, I found that it was the best time for me to reflect and to do a couple of writing projects and to do a lot of reading. Except for the summer before my junior year, I attended a pretty selective philosophy and literature camp at Stanford. And I think there I met a lot of uh, really, really intelligent people, and I got a like idea of what that was like. That really inspired me because some. A lot of these students would later on go to attend, like, I think half of them attended St Stanford, like, after they went to this camp. And, like, a bunch of them attended, like, Williams and, like, Amherst, like, top liberal arts colleges, or other Ivy League schools, Harvard, Yale, whatever. They're absolutely brilliant people, and I really um, learned a lot from that camp, even though it was kind of intimidating, because I was like, wow, people are, like, listening here. And in eighth grade, I also went to CTY. I was, I was also involved in CTY for a couple of years, but that was... Okay, last important. question. Yeah. The Stanford... Uh, the one philosophy and the lit literary. Mm -hmm. This one is uh, through the pre-college class. No, 
it's something else it's called the Stanford um, Humanities Institute. Oh, so okay. yeah. So I encourage anybody who's like interested in history. Which huh? I'm sorry. Oh, uh, which grade? I was okay. for junior year. So if they have a late age limit, like they have to be attending um, sixteen. Uh, you have to be either going into junior year or senior year. So like yeah. Um, so if anyone's interested in like history, like literature, like that kind of thing, um, I really encourage applying to this camp. It's really great. And also, the mission trip is it counted as a service, uh, like community service? Yeah, it was community service. Our school, everybody went, so like it wasn't. Can yeah. you clarify? Is it a CQI or is it, is it Stanford Human Pre-Collegiate Oh, um, CQI is something else. Um, Stanford. This one wasn't part of the Stanford Pre-Collegiate Institute. It was called the Stanford Humanities Institute. So it's a special endeavor by the Stanford Humanities like department to institute like a high school um, learning program. And we were actually taught by real Stanford professors, like, um, and they're both like absolutely like wonderful people. And um, it wasn't part of the pre-collegiate program. It was a separate thing. You didn't have to stay uh, in Stanford or you, have, you can choose to like uh, commute? I think everybody stayed in Stanford. We all stayed in one house and lived together. How's the workload? Is you have to like having reading writing? Oh, uh, we had a reading syllabus about like this thick, and um, we read like an article every night. But it was pretty dense material. It was nothing that I encountered at school. So we read a lot like Proust and like a lot of like Martha, something like we like we had a lot of, like weird like academic stuff. But it really helps you um, learn how to critically read in the deeper like level at an academic level for college. How many so. weeks? Three weeks. I think I remember this one. You have to be before that day. You have to be eight, uh, sixteen. No oh, I think yeah. probably yeah. yeah. yeah I, I know this is a very selective program. It's very selective. So what do they look at? Um, I think the application process. There was an essay, and you had to submit your grades. Um, teacher recommendation, teacher recommendation, essay, and grades, and you can either submit an essay, I believe, like from one of your classes that you wrote in English class, or you can like write a new one from one of their prompts. So I think they mostly just look at the essays and the teacher recs overall. So do you uh, or any credit? Credit? Uh, I don't believe so. A lot of people actually got um, professor recommendations from the this camp too. So it's pretty great. Oh, one more question. For the yeah. CTY, which course did you have to take? Oh, I took international politics in eighth grade. <laughs> that was pretty cool. That's the only the two summer you are, like the uh, summer before junior and the summer before uh, freshman year. Fre uh, freshman year. Yeah. All right. So a couple of numbers. <laughs> so had a three four point three three weighted GPA, and I think they don't want report unweighted, but I think that's what it was. And um, I took the SAT twice, once in freshman year. And I got 2310, I believe, and then I took it again and got a higher score senior year. But the only reason why I took it uh, senior year was because I found out that if any of you are interested in the like, National Merit Program, I think you've heard of it, um, you take the PSAT your junior year, and then you're in the running to become like a National Merit Scholar and a finalist. And so in order to be a finalist, you have to submit your SAT scores again. And they only accept SAT scores from your sophomore year or above. I didn't know that until senior year, so I had to take it again. Um, they don't accept freshman year SATs, so yeah, that's that. What like a bef um, you have to be before uh, sophomore year, is uh, that okay? No, be uh, no after sure. sophomore. After year. sophomore, sophomore, junior, SA uh, senior year SATs they take for the qualifi qualifying like process of the national merit. Yeah. So how many classes take for junior? Oh, how many classes I took? Yeah. Um. You mean for like my school classes? Yeah, you have five here. Oh yeah. Okay. So um, our school limits you to two AP classes. Actually, they don't let you take more than two AP classes. So the reason why I have five is because I studied a lot on my own, and I talked to teachers when I wanted to take an AP class in that subject. I took um, U.S. history and statistics at school for my AP classes, and all the rest of them are just honors classes or regular classes because they don't they don't let us take more than two APs. So for calculus A, B, I studied on my own, like online. For physics B and English language, I just talked to a teacher, and she let a couple of people take APs like that. Senior year, um, I took three, actually. They gave me an exception. I took chemistry, a psych, and English lit, and I studied calculus B, C on my own and took that. So yeah. So in colleges 
ask you how many APs you took. Do they count senior years, even though you have uh, they have a section on the common app where you list your APs and you say it's pending. You just say pending. It's like the score's not out yet. And SAT subjects, I took uh, 800 math, uh, 770 chemistry, and 740 lit. So I took the chemistry one <coughs> before I took AP chemistry. I took it after chemistry um, introduction. So I recommend taking it after AP chem. I think it would have been a lot easier. But it, yeah. And lit is really hard. So unless you're really good at lit, I don't recommend taking lit. But yeah. How do you prepare for them then? Because it, you've got a very good score, seven, um, uh, 740. Uh, did you prepare? I, I got a book and I did a couple of sample. But I think if you're good at the critical reading on SAT, if you're really like into that, then you'd probably do fairly well in lit. So it's just getting into that like idea of like, like how the critical thinking, a uh, critical reading part on SAT works. Which book do so you recommend for that? I just got Burns. Burns. Yeah. So. Uh, Oh, I also took uh, 700. I got 700 on Spanish this year just because it's past my language department, but that was not part of the college app process. Oh, so huh? You yeah. Did you take the AP Spanish? No, I didn't. Our school is not for it, so. Um, I got a couple of awards throughout the years. Um, I won awards for the National Computational Linguistics Olympiad. I actually found out about this competition through a one of my friends I met at Stanford, um, the Stanford camp. Uh, I'm not sure if any of you have heard of it, you probably have, but it's kind of like math puzzles, but like with words. It's kind, of, it's kind of a weird thing, but if you're interested in that, you should probably look it up. Yeah. yeah and how did you prepare for that? I, they have some sample questions online, and you just print them out and like do them on your own. They have a book too, if you're interested in that. So, yeah, if you're good at the Amy, you might be good at this, I think. Um, I was a semi-finalist for that. Uh, I was also a uh, top ten uh, national, a uh, top five national actually for a competition called WordWrite that our school sponsored when I was a freshman and sophomore. It's a reading comprehension um, competition, and I really like that, so, so I entered it. So the WordWrite is a group. Uh, you have a group. Uh, I think your school has to have a team of people. But our our school just did it for like um, English classes, so we just um, registered as a team for our entire English class and you take a test like five times a year. And if you have a really high score, then you get into like the national rankings. And I also got into English twice. I didn't really prepare for math competitions actually. I just took it, just cause. So, <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, I also won a couple of um, school awards, like the English department award. I won it in seventh grade, in ninth grade, in 11th grade, and senior year. So it's just like, uh, they give out awards to two students every year for like uh, every department, and I got it four times for English because I like or English was like my strong subject. So for the uh, for the essay subtests, so you you only take three. Uh, yeah. So you submit them all, or you I submit don't all yours. Uh, hmm? You submit every score you have to the school. I did, yeah. I think a lot of schools require to send every score actually, but I don't recommend taking more than three SAT subjects. Not worth it. So, I have a question. Uh, you said you took a lot of uh, AP classes outside of the school, so is taking online? Online, uh, uh, CTY actually. CTY online was oh, okay. my main. Um, okay, okay. Yeah. Okay. It's a really good resource. And linguistic Olymp Olympia is a is a reading or is a logic or something else? Uh, it's. I would say it's logic. It's kind of like um, it's like have you heard of like cryptography puzzles? Like it's kind of like, I think you can search it up. It's kind of hard to describe. It's like a really mathy, logical sort of thinking, but they use words instead of numbers. So you're trying to decipher. They re they give you like a really like ancient foreign language that nobody knows about, and they give you a couple of clues, and you have to find out what the language is, like translate it. So it's it's kind of yeah, it's very these, interesting. These these words you have were they in the sophomore year, junior year? All uh, right. So, oh, the competition linguistics Olympiad was junior year and senior year. So I got into the semifinals for both years. Uh, WordWrite was freshman year and sophomore year. And Amy, I got in junior and senior year. So, so it's for also the English uh, Olympiad, uh, yours it is school you register or you go some other place. Uh, for WordWrite, my I'm a man for linguistics. Oh, linguistics. Um, I went to a college. Take I went to Stanford actually to take that because our school doesn't do that. Yeah, they have one at San Jose State and Stanford, I think. So. Uh, so 
Yeah, because um, when you re register for national merit and you're a finalist, like you're a semi-finalist and you want to be a finalist, you have to send your SAT score again to confirm that you're good enough for the finalist program. And uh, if you take it freshman year, the score doesn't count because it's too early. So it, is that a very prestigious program? Oh, the National Merit? Yeah, yeah. I would say that it is. But if a freshman yeah. already took the SAT and everybody thinks it's good enough, is it worth it to take it again like later just for this National Merit program? If you're a freshman and you get a really high score, like say you get like a 2200 above usually, mm -hmm. that means you're, you have a big chance of actually getting into National Merit. So if you're a freshman and you get it like 2100 and you're satisfied with that, or you get 2000 or whatever, then like that's okay. But if you think you might have a chance at qualifying for national merit, then I suggest taking it sophomore or later. So, so yeah. do they only recognize the uh, SAT national merit SAT? Yeah, national only SAT. SAT. Okay. It's part of the college board, which does SAT. Okay. Yeah. The AP classes, did you take them mainly in the school or outside of school? Uh, so, U.S. History and Stats I took in school as their classes. Um, physics and English I took in school, but they weren't AP classes. They were regular, they were honors classes. And I studied on my own. Like, I got a big book and did a bunch of problems on my own for that. Um, calculus I completely did on my own. Um, chem, Psych, and Lit I did in school. So it's, it's a mixture, I guess. <laughs> oh, sorry, yeah. Yeah, but I just continuing on that question. Um, the calculus, you say you get it on your own. Is it self study or? 2013, um, 2014 year, and they talked about how what the the plans for graduate after graduation for their seniors, and um. I think 35% are have accepted a job offer or internship offer. 18% uh, a graduate school, um, peer fellowship, service opportunity. 20% of them weren't really sure. So you have to be proactive about that if you go to the board's call about getting a job. But it's definitely possible, and it's um, like really great with that. So there's like a lot of information here. And I think each college would have like a little um, flyer about that. And so, yeah. Alright, so most students go uh, after graduation uh, to go to a graduate school, right? Uh, I think on the graph, 35% um, actually accepted a job offer like after they graduated right then, and 18% went to grad school, and a couple other like fellowship opportunities or service opportunities. Or whatever, so, yeah. Alright, so uh, according to a couple of sources that I'll cite later, um, 33% of Fortune 500 company CEOs have liberal arts degrees. Uh, this, is, this doesn't necessarily mean that they graduated from a liberal arts college, but they have some sort of liberal arts degree that, like, we'll see in the next slide. They aren't necessarily, like, business or, like, tech degree. Um, uh, the number one college, according to the pay scale college rankings, which um, calculates the net return on investment, is Harvey Mudd, the engineering college. So the 20-year net return on investment means, this number means um, the 20 year median pay of a graduate from that college minus the 24 year median pay of a high school graduate. So how much the difference is, minus their college tuition, so yeah. And a lot of colleges measure the success of their graduates by using um, the Grateful Grads Index, which means that they measure how much their graduates actually donate back to the school, how satisfied they were with their undergraduate experience. And seven out of the ten colleges and universities with most graduate donations are liberal arts colleges. So liberal arts colleges have very grateful graduates um, who are very successful and donate a lot back to them. Did you ever see any breakdown of these numbers between Caucasians, <laughs> Asian Chinese, uh, Indians? <laughs> um, I'm sure it's out there, but I didn't really look that up. <laughs> yeah. You think about it. CEO is a Caucasian. The head of engineering is Chinese. <laughs> <laughs> the head of marketing is Indian. Oh. In America, 
Yeah, um, maybe. Uh, yeah, I didn't really look at the racial statistics for the um, great book guys. Until we let them finish them, we have to answer the question. Yeah. So these are just a couple examples of famous, uh, like, really successful CEOs or who got, like, who had liberal arts degrees. So they didn't necessarily graduate from liberal arts colleges, but they had, like, uh, liberal-ish, like, educate, like, degrees. So Mark Zuckerberg, for example, he was a psychology major who studied classics. He did a lot of computer science projects on the side, though, so he had interest in all of that. Mitt Romney, English major, Peter Thiel, who's the um, CEO and the founder of PayPal, who was a philosophy major. Um, Jerry Brown, governor of California, who's a classics major, and Carly Fiorina, who's the ex-HP CEO and who's running president. He was, uh, she was a medieval history and philosophy major, so this is just like a really short list of um, successful people who are like majored in something um, liberal artsy. And uh, Steve Jobs, who went to read college, he dropped out, but um, he went to read. Uh, he says that it's in Apple's DNA that technology alone is not enough. It's technology married with the liberal arts, married with the humanities, that yields us the results that make our hearts sing. And it's a really poetic quote, and it's really like, yeah. But I think it's really true in that if you want to be like successful nowadays in um, business tech, like you have to have a good understanding of the humanities in order to like think beyond your now and like look at the f future consequences of um, like the human impact it has in like, society and like history and understand the bigger picture. And like of course Steve Jobs like um, like Apple products are like really artistically designed because he studied like typography in college. And so yeah, humanities and arts are really important too. All right, the future. So uh, uh, part four on passion leadership and making interviewers cry. So this is how to get into these colleges and what they're looking for. So, first of all, leadership. Um, leadership is very important to college apps. And um, I believe leadership is learning how to serve others with your utmost capacity. It's not necessarily uh, learning how to like direct other people, like manipulate other people, but um, learning how to give yourself and dedicate your energy to like helping others grow. I, th I think I read once that like the best leaders are the people who can see the potential in others and like. Um, raise them up according to that. So leadership takes many different forms. It doesn't always have to mean that you're the president of a club or the captain of a team. Uh, for example, I think I, I, I was the, um, the editor-in-chief of the magazine, but I think my leadership role was a lot beyond that in school too. Like for example, in orchestra, uh, I was a pianist and a lot of the underclassmen would come to me like with advice and just talk about like their um, high school like struggles and like their academic problems and uh, I would like advise them on that. A lot of my friends were um, leadership, like had a lot of leadership goals in that too. And also being like an intellectual leader, like somebody who's willing to um, raise their hand in class and like start interesting conversations and discussions. And uh, I know like a lot of my friends would always like come to me, for example, to ask for like book recommendations because I was like the girl who like read a lot. And so like when they were like, when they want to talk about something like, um, discuss a certain idea, they would like come to me. And I think that's like being an intellectual leader. So and leadership like has many different forms. And leadership involves being dedicated, vulnerable, open-minded, and passionate. And what this means is that dedication, you spend your time and your energy. And the people who are leaders are often the people who like invest most of their time and like their energy in doing something. Vulnerable, being authentic, and not trying to put on like a facade of like who you think uh, people would like, but like being authentic open-minded, like open-minded people's ideas and suggestions, and passionate. And passionate, I'll talk about in this slide. Passion seems to be a magical word nowadays. People are always telling you to find your passion. But I think that passion is something that's um, like grown, not found. So it involves dedication and hard work and being very, uh, I guess like you don't always feel excited about something, but you can still be passionate about it. Like for example, like reading and writing, I wasn't just like really excited about every essay I got either. Like sometimes I would have like a um, in-class essay and I would dread it like so much. But every time like I did finish an essay and I finished, I feel like a sense of like accomplishment and I really loved it a lot. And uh, uh, I think passion, um, it's also, you shouldn't be like selfish in your passion, which means that you can't like focus on only yourself. <laughs> I'm um, trying to like say how I can like get ahead. Passion has to do with like learning how to s like see like your interest and your um, abilities and how to like apply that to the outside world too and like 
reaching out to our community in many different forms. So for example, if you're passionate about something like, well, like me, like reading and writing, I can like start a literary magazine, I can talk to a bunch of teachers, I can like talk to my friends, I can try to like start book clubs or whatever, like, so try to involve other people and like bring them into your passion too. And so, for example, if you're like passionate about video games, like you don't have to like sit there and like play video games all day, but you can be passionate about that and like write articles like about video games, like about psychology or like study like game theory and like um, like get into math, like get into this, like little nuts and bolts of like little video games and stuff. So think beyond like um, I guess uh, what you might like see like right in front of you. And passion is also about like making connections to other fields of like uh, I guess thinking beyond the box and how you can impact your community. It's also passion. So if you're good with like people, if you're like if you like talking to people and you're really social, like maybe um get involved with a couple like of programs like Echo, I guess, or like a mentoring program or like help underclassmen and I think uh, don't get like too hung up on like having one single thing as your passion either. If you have an interest in something, like even fleetingly in um, high school, especially for like you freshmen and sophomores out there, like explore your options, attend a bunch of club meetings, and once you find something that you're interested in, you don't have to be good at it necessarily. Um, like devote all your energy into that and like um, work at it like as hard as you can. So I have a friend who, um, uh, for example, she was really she's going to a really great college this year, Berkeley. Um, she is really good at work. Uh, she's really she doesn't have one main passion necessarily, but she was really into art, graphic design in high school. She's also part of the debate team. Um, she played piano and she liked biology. So that was like a lot of like spread out passions. And I think, but what like she did really well was that she invested like so much of her energy and time into every like single passion she had and like tried to like impact as many people as she can with that. Like designing posters for the school or uh, like leading the debate team and like mentoring the younger students in debate. And the teachers really saw that, and they saw how much like dedication and um, hard work she put into that. Even though she wasn't necessarily like the most best artist out there, or like the best debater like there ever was in the league, she really, uh, yeah, showed her passion about that. And I think that's really important. People will see that, and the teachers will see that. Um, all right, so yeah, I encourage you really to. Um, I think what my college is looking for, a lot of liberal arts colleges and like big universities are looking for is your like intellectual curiosity, like your ability to think beyond the box, like how much your experiences and your interests can like, you can use that no matter how good you are at that um, interest to like contribute to your community in every way possible. <coughs> essays, so just really briefly about essays, I won't be like saying that much, but write in your own voice about your own story. What colleges are looking for in your essays are who are you and how can you reflect on your experiences and realize a purpose for your future. So how much, like, what can you bring to our school, I guess? So what I wrote about in my Common App essay was, um, it wasn't a very, like, unique or, like, very super exciting topic, but I think I really, like, showed who I am and, like, how I reflected on my own history. So I wrote about Chinese school. And because I was, when I was little, I was, like, a really rebellious kid in Chinese school. I was, like, a bad girl. And I didn't get that many good grades in Chinese school. And I really didn't like the teachers there. And, um, I had a lot of like cultural conflict with them too. I was like, you know, they, like, they don't understand me, they don't understand anything. I was like kind of, yeah, like that. So I wrote about that in my Common App essay and I um, talked about how uh, my conflict with a certain like teacher um, back in Chinese school. And then I jumped forward in time. So um, back to last summer when I went back to ask for a tutoring, like a uh, look at tutoring opportunities. So I was talking with a teacher and I um, reflected in my essay on how much I finally understood that they're human just like me. I mean, they have a lot of like flaws and they were culturally limited by like who they were. Um, but I could learn to love them like despite like my past like conflicts with them, and, I guess. And I think that really showed how like I could, I think I wanted to like try to be like, uh, love people like dif uh, despite like um, cultural differences and like try to understand adults like past like generational gaps and all that. So yeah, that's what I wrote about. So I think everybody has like a different thing to write about, like, and a lot of uh, and write your own voice too. Like I gave my essay like to edit to one of my friends, and he was like, "What the heck are you writing? Like uh, this is like something like I could never write, and um, this kind of like language I wouldn't use either." But uh, so yeah, I guess write like write your own voice and how you normally um, would say things. Which prompt do you write? Prompt. Uh, I think I wrote number five, the transition from childhood to adulthood. 
So when I was a child, I had like a really limited experience and like I was really self-centered and all that. And when I was an adult, I could, uh, yeah, connect with more people, so. But they're really broad, the pumps are really broad, so. You could bend the pumps anyway. Oh yeah, and so somebody asked earlier about Pomona's um, supplement essay. So Pomona's uh, had a really great supplement essay I really loved. And they have it, they use it every year, so they have it this year too, if you're thinking about buying Pomona. And it, it's design your own critical inquiry course. So I think I showed earlier a couple of really weird, um, like the critical inquiry courses like have a lot of like weird topics and stuff. So they want students to explore their own academic interests and make as many connections as possible and design their own critical inquiry course. So during the admitted students weekend this year, when I went in April, um, the they offered us a little brochure of student topics that they wrote about this year. So for example, these are all from the student brochure. Like these are real student essays. And one was called The Mind of a zero List Society, and they wanted to explore societies with uh, without the mathematical concept of zero, so ancient societies who hadn't discovered zero yet, and how that would function in terms of like their society, I guess. One is called The Sound of Silence. They investigated the um, meaning and purpose of silence and how that's important to like our psychology, I guess, and like um, society too. Uh, Fukushima, Facts, Vision, and Future. Um, they investigated the Fukushima disaster in Japan and how that contributed to like public policy and um, scientific, like I guess like the nuclear um, policy and what that means for the future of Japan and Japanese culture and all that. Um, one was about uh, interstellar utopia, Star Trek's futuristic philosophy. So somebody who was really into Star Trek wanted to investigate the, um, the utopian society that sort of Star Trek created and what that was like, like how can society become so advanced that um, like they can create a utopia and all that, and the philosophy of Star Trek. Um, another one was called The Community Chinese of Politics, a study of the Sino-American gap guy in government, the difference between um, Chinese and American media, and the humor in um, Chinese American media. So I think they had like 10 or so topics, and they were like really, really, they're all really interesting. And I didn't, um, yeah, so like a couple of topics like these. So I think they really, they're li really looking for people who can think beyond the box and make connections to different like um, topics when they're looking for this prompt. Oh yeah, the one I wrote about, I wrote about, um, uh, I think, I wrote a book called Godel Escher Bach back in um, the beginning of senior year, which is a really interesting book about how mathematics, art, uh, music can be tied into, uh, can be tied together. So I wrote about, I think, uh, how we can connect the science and mathematics with humanities and arts um, with regards to how to like, um, I think like talk about like identity and uh, recursion and like uh, yeah I think I um, I could say that more if people are interested but it's pretty cool and finally mentorships uh, I think mentorships have been a huge part of my experience in high school uh, and I really really in love the connections I made with teachers and the, I think the most important thing when you're looking for a mentor is interest like if you're interested in their life and what they're doing. And if you express that interest to them, they will also take an interest in you because interest is like reciprocal. If you like somebody, they generally like you too. And um, so, for example, I was really close to my English teacher from my freshman year and my junior year. I also, I also really loved my chemistry teacher, my AP Chem teacher. So at lunch times, I would go to talk to my um, English teacher about like art history and. Um, books like Proust and like Rumi, poetry, different kinds of poetry. We just go out to lunch and like discuss like the meaning of life sometimes and like really fascinating things. Like she wrote a book too and she um, she gave me a copy to read and we talked about that. And my um, science teacher, my chemistry teacher, he was a, she's a, he's a really, really brilliant guy. Went to UCSF I think. And so I'd go to him at lunch, me and my friend would make it a habit to like go to him and talk about um, books that we read, like Guns, Jones, and Steel, and like Civilization, and like, he, he knew a lot about ancient religion, actually, ancient Babylonian religion, and we talked about that sometimes. And we also like developmental evolution, and anything that took our interest, we just go to him, and he would love talking to us about his interests and what he read about. And um, my English teacher in ninth grade from Wisconsin, he would, he and I would email too, and he was really into like Southern writers, so he liked Faulkner and Morrison a lot. That was his research interest. So even as a ninth grader, I'd say after school, uh, after class, and like try to like get him to talk to me about that too. And like he was, he loved to talk about that. 
So I think teachers are really fascinating and they have a lot of really great life experiences. And I think uh, going to a small school really helped me with that too. I'm sure you can probably do it. At your bigger school, so I'm not really sure what that's like, but I think King's really helped me with um, learning how to do, like have mentors in my life who can both like advise me personally in my personal life and my talking about like um, my future and like my major and my college decisions and like the meaning of life as well as like academics and like academic interests I had. And they're also really good for teacher acts. I think that was a really important part too. And finally, interviewing. So um, every school is different in terms of interviews. Some schools like, I know, I think uh, Amherst doesn't even offer interviews because they think some people have like an unfair geographical advantage when it comes to interviews. They don't even offer interviews. But for Pomona, interviews are extremely important, especially if you live in California, or if you live close to the school. My friend who attended Pomona last year, she uh, had a, she didn't, ha she didn't go off campus for interviews. She went outside. She just had like alumni interview in the area, and she, uh, I think she spent four or five hours talking to her interviewer because she's that she's that kind of girl and like she really, um, she had a really good interview. And she said like one of the reasons why she got to Pomona was probably because of her interview. And I think same for me too. So I went on campus for an interview back in um, November, and I interviewed with a student, so uh, um, a senior at Pomona, who I later found out was the um, school president, actually. She was the class president, student council president. And it was really interesting, because a lot of other schools I interviewed with, with like Brown, I think, and um, Middlebury, they would have a list of questions they asked you, like, um, where do you hope to be in 20 years? And like. What are your favorite things to do and like that kind of thing. But the girl at Pomona was like, she was a really different kind of interviewer. So she sat me down and she was like, um, what is your favorite class last year? And I said English. Um, I really like junior English. And she was like, well, what do you like about that class? And what did you read in that class? So I talked about like, I think T.S. Eliot. And she was like, why do you like that? Why, why do you like the books that you like? Can you tell me more about that? So I talked about an author I really liked who went to Pomona. He was a Pomona professor called David Foster Wallace. And she also knew about these authors, and also she was, I think, a Latin American studies major. And I talked about a couple of Latin American authors too that I read in the past year, like Borges and um, Gabriel Garcia Marquez. And so she really connected with me about that. So we spent a bunch of time talking about um, the importance of like literature and arts and what that meant for society. And we talked about like empathy, like learning how to connect with people through art and literature. And uh, I think. Uh, also about like the meaning of life, about like suicide, because David Foster Wallace committed suicide to, in 2006, and that like, had a huge impact on the Pomona community. So we talked about how we can like um, how we can use art and literature to, I guess, like express our humanity, and how that can often like illuminate the pain within us too. And also how um, a lot of people put on a facade. I think one of David Foster Wallace's stories talked about this. Like people put on a facade of like who they think they ought to be in front of people when a lot of people feel very vulnerable inside and very like how they can't express who they are. And we're like, we have that hidden like recess within us of like, and so we really connected on a very deep level. I think we had a really deep conversation about that. And at the end she was like, I think you, you almost made me cry. Like, cause like, <laughs> I was like, oh, okay, I'm not sure it's a good thing or not. But it was really, really cool. I think, I think it really helped me get into Pomona too. But I think every school is different when it comes to interviews. So yeah, it, yeah, so just like, be authentic in your interviews and um, research the culture of your school and what kind of questions they might ask and really try to talk about like what makes you, what you're passionate about and like what moves you, I guess. So finally, so, oh yeah, sorry, go ahead. For the interview, did you prepare for the interview? What did you do for the interview? Did uh, you also do a lot of research for the Pomona history and you know, all the different kind of, you know, different kind of topics? Um, Okay, well, for Pomona, I, that was my first interview, I think. I, I wrote like a huge long list of questions. I researched online for questions they might ask me, and I wrote a really long answer to like each of those questions. But I actually didn't use any of them, because the interviewer didn't do it that way. So, like for example, I mentioned David Foster Wallace, because I knew he was a Pomona uh, alumni, or he was a Pomona teacher, I mean, professor. So I mentioned him, because I knew that that was something that Pomona was interested in. And I think it was just by sheer luck that I also read a lot of like Latin American literature, and the girl who interviewed me was really into that too. But like, I think a lot of schools are like more uh, like I think more technical, I guess. Like some schools have more technical interviews, like and 
I guess like just go online and research like what people's past interview experiences are like and ask your friends who interviewed at school too. So yeah. I'll go ahead. There's been like uh, many different sides and many different remarks on it, but do you know if there's more weight placed on like alumni interviews or like on campus interviews? Because some people say that on campus shows more interest, but uh, I think it depends on the school. Like for Pomona, for Pomona. um Especially if you live in California, they really encourage you to go on campus. But like my friend also interviewed off campus and she had a really great experience with that. So but I really I think if you want to apply to Pomona, you should go on campus. Yeah. So your friend only got to one interview, only one to one interview or she did both? The one who went to Pomona? Only one. Oh she only one, yeah. Oh only one. So just a brief overview of what we talked about today. First of all, a liberal arts education is about educating the whole person. It develops the leaders in today's world because it allows you to think like big picture, innovatively outside your own field, to recognize problems in the world like um, with regards to society and like, so you're not only focused on your own um, field, but also like learn how to develop connections. And also, it makes you very articulate and communi um, communicative, so you're good at talking to people um, and expressing your ideas. Uh, liberal arts colleges are teaching focused rather than research, even though they also offer many good research opportunities, of course. They're personal and they're interdisciplinary. The people that liberal arts colleges are looking for aren't afraid to ask why. They're very intellectually curious. They have a range of interests, so you can be like somebody who's interested in um, science, mathematics, or like humanities. Um, the pers I think, or athletics even, like I think they're just looking for a range of people. And people who care about something greater than themselves. They're not really selfish and like focus only on how they can get into college, but how they can like eventually impact the world with the education they've been given. Uh, how my parents have helped me. So uh, my parents were really great in my um I think generally we got along pretty well, even though we had some like disagreements. Um, they worked alongside me in the college search process, but they allowed me to research what I wanted and make my own decisions. So uh, most of the colleges on my list, I researched myself, and I knew what I wanted, and my parents, I would tell my parents what I wanted, um, and they would help me, uh, help me with research too, but uh, in the long run, I think with my class choices in high school, uh, extracurricular choices, my major, and my college, um, they respected my decision as to like what I wanted, but also, um, I think they also like had a really, uh, they made me like they sat me down a lot and like made me talk about like communicate what my um, future was like they made me think about that like try to inspire me and so I said I was interested in reading and writing for example so they helped me my parents searched me like helped me search up extracurricular opportunities like literary magazine they encouraged me with that a lot and summer programs like the Stanford program like my mom helped me research that too and um, they also emphasize a balanced lifestyle, like saying there's more to life in college, and they didn't really like try to force me into competitions, but they really emphasize leadership and like how can you think about what you're like, what you're doing, and how you can affect people like in the school. So, yeah. The purpose of education, as I see it, is being intellectually curious, socially aware, and growing as a human being. And Liberal arts colleges are really great for that, but I think you can get that at any college like that offers liberal education, like any big university even, depending on the person you are. Um, so always be curious as to what you learn and love what you're learning, and socially aware, like how you can affect other people with that, and, and your own growth too, like how um, <coughs> consider yourself. And yeah, college isn't everything, but learning is very, very important. So take it upon yourself to have those intellectual conversations, doing projects that you love. And college will like fall into place right into that too, because colleges are looking for people who are like authentic, and they're not trying to like just craft a resume for the sake of getting into college, but people who are authentic about um, what they love. So um, really ask yourself and write these answers down eventually. Like, what are my strengths and weaknesses? How can I focus on my um, strengths and like how can I help my weakness weaknesses? If I had a year to myself to do anything I wanted to do, what would I use my time for? What subjects do you find interesting? What do you wish you were good at? Um, what do you want to work on in the future, like in terms of subject, um, academic subjects? And who is that person you hope to be at the end of high school, at the end of college? And if you're like looking for how to search for colleges or like what you're interested in, I think it's, these questions are a good um, starting point to have better discussions later on. So yeah. So also, I think reading is an extremely important part. Like even if you're not like uh, English person like me, like a 
reading is extremely important to like open your um, perspective. And so these are the books I read since the beginning of ninth grade. I had a like reading list that I compiled and kept on adding to that as I went along in high school. And they don't include school assignments. And the ones I bolded are the ones I particularly loved. So um, read a range of like nonfiction and fiction, and I think explore like different genres. And if you find something that you really love, you can like um, go into that too. So. Yeah. Um, for example, like I think mean, this one I recommend to all my friends who are into um, technology and science. And Little Escher Bach, it's a huge book. I think it's this big, and it's about technology, or mathematics, um, art, and music, and how those all relate. And computer science and um, psychology and like cognitive science and linguistics, like it has everything in it. It's a really, really good, thing. Um, really good book. And. Yeah, a couple science fiction books, um, <coughs> and like <coughs> historical fiction and all that, so, yeah. Uh, what's the ratio between the fiction and non-fiction? Oh, huh. um, I like fiction a lot, personally. So I think probably five to ten books on this list are non-fiction. So most of them are, uh, I mean, non-fiction, so most of them are fiction. But if you're like more of a non-fiction person, like you should you can, like do that more too. Yeah. yeah. I was just about to ask, um, like what genre? What genre? Like, what do I like? Um, I really like. Mm, I like sci-fi a lot, but not only that. Like I like really poetic stuff, I guess. <laughs> so yeah, I like poetry a lot too. So yeah. Um, have you, you are going to mention like what is the writing competition or something? Oh, writing competitions. Uh, where we can find those writing competitions. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. What writing competition you are? Uh, um, I actually didn't enter writing competitions because writing competitions are like, uh, I think for like creative writing a lot more. Like if your student is into creative writing, they can look into like the Scholastic Art and Review or like the Claremont Review. There's a lot of online resources for that. But I wasn't really into uh, creative writing. I was more like literary analysis. So. I didn't do that many like stories, so I didn't submit them to any writing competi like competitions in high school. But yeah, if you're interested in that, you can like come later and like ask more about that, I guess. Uh, yeah. So finally, liberal learning is that which underlies that which gives purpose and direction to practical skills. It tries to distinguish between the more and less important, between the grand and the trivial, and to concern itself with the center rather than the periphery. So just to conclude. Um, it gives purpose and direction to practical skills and like shows you where you're going in the future and um, gives you a bigger picture. And it's very important. So, yeah. Any more questions? You mentioned several times about leadership. Leadership? Yeah. And uh, you, at the beginning, showed you became the editor in chief of yeah. the school literary I think. journal or magazine. Yeah. Can you talk about that a little bit? Did the magazine exist? Did you create it? And how did you come up with the courage or the drive to create it? Oh, okay. So the literary magazine, our school doesn't even have a newspaper. They don't have a magazine. They don't have anything. So I think that really helped me in that. Um, so I had an a English teacher in ninth grade who um, used to do advising at his old school. And he really encouraged me because like, I think um, I did really well in this class, and he was like, you know, you should like try to start like some sort of like writing endeavor because you're good at that. And so he really encouraged me with that. And so over the summer before tenth grade, I started thinking about that, asking a couple of friends who are into like art, how to like organize this entire thing. And I, in the beginning of the school year in tenth grade, I emailed um, the PR director of our school, Mrs. Hayward, and the English department head, and we coordinated a couple of meetings and got that started. So. Was it online or? Oh, paper oh, we published biannually, which is like in print, and people just email them um, us their stories, and we publish that. So, yeah. do you attend any sports activity? No, I don't do any sports. So, so how will you come up with a uh, ten uh, common app activity? Uh, I don't have. To, I don't have ten actually. You don't have to fill up all ten. Um, I just did. Uh, I think three magazine. I did uh, music. Involvement. I'm involved in my church. A couple of like volunteering opportunities with that. Uh, what else? Is there? Yeah, I did. I think I only had like six rows filled. 
like the mission strip service opportunities. So award like, is not included. No, they only have five five places for awards. So yeah. Yeah. Every student who applies for Monarch. Not every student, but if you live in California, they highly recommend you to go down and do interviews. Mm -hmm. But yeah, you can you can go like go on without interviewing too. Yeah. Yeah. Website that, uh, South California, especially yeah. if you apply to Mona, we highly recommend it. But now it's California, you just see Yeah, yeah. You, you just have, they have a, an online website where they, um, you can like register for a certain day. But, uh, I mean, yeah, if you live in North California, it's not as, like, required, but, yeah, it's, it's still recommended. Like, um, my son think he should write something about major, but he's like you, he can, his oh. interest is, you know, everywhere, yeah. Um, uh, I said, well, you don't need to write, uh, what's your major that you like in your essay, but he said, I have to find something, he writes something, economic, you know, something, he really doesn't know what oh. economic is, you know, so. Okay, so I think it depends on the school. Like, for, I think, um, I think Brown, like if you made, like if you declare a certain major, you have to write an essay about your major interest. And I think Carnegie Mellon also had an essay poem, like write about like your academic interests and like what you hope to like major in and your programs you want to do. But like for Pomona, like you don't, they don't really consider like major interest as much. They really don't. So just write about your like what you've been interested in recently. Yeah. One follow up. One oh, yeah, follow up yeah. on the magazine. Do you know what's the eventual circulation? How many copies were circulated? Oh, I think we print out 100 copies every year, and they generally sell like 80, I guess. So yeah, even small school, so. Mm -hmm. Uh huh. Imagine how we get to them because some yeah. some uh, in computer did become so corrected you are some mistake then you you got to draft the proof. Some make you thinking rethinking. How do you uh, how do we because we don't have feeling oh, okay. of self we are foreigners. So how do you thinking of oh, this one is good like helping? How to judge is a good institute or not? Um, What's the criteria? I'm not. I guess if you like hire outside tutors, like I, did, I never had an outside English tutor. Mm -hmm. um, it's really hard to like find, like I think with English in particular, you might want to find someone you connect with really. Because like, I mean writing, like especially like writing college essays is a really personal process. I mean, but I, 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 I mean writing, writing. Like writing for college essays or for? No, 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 just for regular. Oh. Uh, for regular writing, um, for creative writing or just like essays? Yeah. I guess you can search around for some, um, I know I went to a tutoring agency called Improve Your English. They have some pretty good tutors there, but I'm not, I'm not, I don't know sure because I, I never had any tutors, but, huh? How do you find a good English tutor? No, how do you like a general tutor? I can sign him with different institutes, but I don't know who helps. Some they come in with different, very different styles. Some they just do that one, they practice several errors, then they do practice two. Some 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 answered a uh, question before, but about how would you recommend approaching like the Y major essay if you're undeclared? Would you, because you said interests, would you talk about like various different interests or would you hold in on? Oh, um, for the like, mm, I don't think any school actually asks you like what major do you want and why. So like, like Brown. Okay. Like, like, Brown has one. Yeah, yeah Brown has one like, if you do like a, I think science technology major, you have to talk about like yeah. that. I think you just talk about like what your experience was in the past, and um, like across your high school career. Oh, oh, I mean, oh, the Brown has like a little section talking about your academic interests, right? Yes. You can just talk about whatever you're interested in. Like, I think um, it doesn't have to be one thing. Okay, so you would recommend like several. 
yeah, if you don't have like a strong like focus necessarily, like it's kind of not that good to like try to yeah. think for something. Yeah. Do you know usually for student interest in liberal school, how many percent of the most do the more interested in humanity rather than STEM? Oh, okay, that's a good question. Um, I think, I think for Pomona, the most interest was in um, the top couple majors are I think econ, humanities, science. I think it's about equal actually. Like, I think it's like fourteen percent in like. Um, science and like 15% and like humanities and things like that. It's like, it's not very, it's not very like humanities skewed if that's what you're asking, but yeah. It depends on the school too, so. So does that environment influence the kids and they turn on, um, you know, select their major? Uh, because the whole school environment is strong at some area and then that's the they turn on, turn on oh. lots of kids and then well, like Pomona, I think is very. Um, they have they're really strong overall. So they're like they have really strong programs in natural sciences too. So their molecular biology major is like really difficult, I think. So um, they have the biology one. Molecular biology. Oh. And like biology right okay. there. So, okay. uh, yeah, I think there's like at least an equal amount of students who are interested in the humanities and natural sciences and then social sciences. So yeah. So for those five colors in the. Yeah. Yeah. So is it easier for Mona to uh, choose courses for modern policy? Um, uh, I think it's difficult in general to register, but it's not like if you're interested in it and you talk to the professor and you express that interest, it's, it shouldn't be that difficult. I think Pomona has a like you have to take at least two thirds of your classes at Pomona, and one third you can like choose whatever. But yeah. Oh right. Yes. Okay. So somebody asked about um, engineering schools, right? And I think um, so. A couple of liberal arts colleges do offer engineering schools. Like uh, Harvey Mudd is like the best one. I guess that one to give. Um, Swarthmore offers engineering majors. Um, I think it's like Bucknell or something. Uh, Smith. 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 Smith is a women's college. Yeah. And, and also there's a lot of um, uh, three plus two yeah. or four plus one program between um, liberal arts school and uh, and also uh, engineering, like especially like Columbia, they have this program a lot. They combine with a lot of different um, LAC school. And also Caltech might have one, I, I'm not sure about. But Columbia and several famous schools, they have three plus two and four plus one. You can. Harbor four. Harbor four. four. Yeah. 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 Harbor four. Uh, yeah. Another one has has uh, uh, four plus one with you can something like that. Yeah. Four plus one. you study four years in Harbor four and then one year in you can you get the master degree graduate from you can. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think for what else do you program? Yeah. Or three um, plus two is three years in one of the liberal arts school and two years in this. Uh, bigger engineering school, they offer you two degree. Mm -hmm. So the, the second part degree school, they have to decide before it's in Yes, yes, when you apply your mention about it. Oh, okay. Yeah, there's a lot of opportunity in mm -hmm. How do you find out this information with the website? Well, you know, yeah, I need it individually, I think. Mm -hmm. Well, you can yeah, yeah. search a lot by yourself, but it's, you, if you really um, try to find a specific one, a specific one maybe that's What's the general term for this kind of a program? Like it's a combined, so plus two. Okay. Yeah. So I think another question is on the workload of the Boris colleges versus um, universities. So I think it really depends on the school. Like I know Swarthmore has a really, really huge workload and it's really intense. and <coughs> depends on your major too. Like, so if you're a Swarthmore engineering major, it's gonna be the workload's gonna be like just as intense as that. Like many universities, like or even more so sometimes. Pomona is generally, I think, a, le a, a bit less intense, but it depends on the major too. Like, if you're a molecular biology major, I heard that's really really difficult. Um, but if you're like a, I don't know, like environmental studies major or something, it's it's gonna be like a bit lighter. So it depends on the major in the school. So yeah. And finally, someone asked for the pros and cons of liberal arts colleges. I think I addressed some um, in the presentation. But um, well, the no con, I think it's very like hard to define because 
Mm, for example, if you have less people in campus, these are pro or con. For some people, these are pro. For some people, these are con. Mm. So, so it's hard to define pro and con. Mm. It's really like fitting your own um, the kids' personality. Mm -hmm. I, I generally, when I uh, visit uh, the art school, have a feeling that not many people run. But <laughs> in a bigger school like Berkeley or um, Brown, and you see a lot of people going around and walking around, and you see the vitality in there. But on the, on the same time, on the other hand, for example, if I visit a Harvard Four, there's only five to six people in a chemistry lab, a big lab, and teachers are talking exactly to these five, six people. <laughs> And those, you, you have the opportunity doing all things you ask a teacher. And, but on the other hand, if you go to a bigger college, you have to, um, you know, <laughs> to share the one, uh, one bench, right? So it's up to you. Uh, no, it's okay. This is our concert job. That is <laughs> 我不懂我不懂我不懂我不懂我不懂我不懂我不懂我不懂我不懂我不懂我不懂我不懂我不懂我不懂我不懂我不懂我不懂我不懂我不懂我不懂我不懂我不懂我不懂我不懂我不懂
So your completed GPA also um, <coughs> including the doesn't reflect the C two I scores. Oh, it doesn't. It's only at my school. So, but those yeah. are AP classes, right? So they, they are, but they don't. My school doesn't like count them. them. So oh, right. yeah, I could have had a higher rated. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what I thought. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Did your GPA include school? No, it's just high school. I'm not really sure about the unweighted one. Like, I'm not, I'm not sure about that because my school doesn't report that. So. So the one is the linguistic Olympian. You said you took a class from Stanford or Stanford? No, I took the um, test at Stanford, but I prepped on my own, just like through books. Yeah. Um, so did you not take the ACT? I didn't take it. Is there any reason why you didn't take it? Uh. Like extra prep time, I guess. I wanted to focus this my time on like APs, and I already had an SAT score. I was like happy with, so I was like, right. yeah. Um, for the APs that you study yourself, your school doesn't offer, right? So where would you go take the AP test? Because like our school, there's certain ones that they don't offer, and they wouldn't act. They don't administer the AP test. Oh, um, actually, our school administered. Well, for example, calculus, like uh. They administer it to like our students, and I just register as like an independent student, and they let me take it there. Uh, they actually offered physics and English because there was enough expressed interest from like other students too. Okay, so you didn't have to go elsewhere. I didn't have to go elsewhere. Okay. Some of my friends did though for other APs, like Italian. Yeah, so how many APs you study on your own? Uh, <coughs> two, three, four. Four, I think. Yeah. So as you apply to Pomona. And then you only took the SAT. So can we say, um, do you know if Pomona prefer SAT or ACT? They don't care. They, they really care. don't care. Yeah, you can just take the ACT and they're like that too. Yeah. So your friends who have to take AT somewhere else, how difficult is, is it to go to some other school to, uh, to get the spot to take it? I only had one friend who took Italian at a different school, but I don't think it should be really difficult. She didn't say it was really hard. She just went there one day and like registered. Mm -hmm. So your ACT is pretty high. So do you know anybody <coughs> below to you and also can enter to uh, Pomona? Uh huh. Do you know the the, the their low, lowest to this year? lowest mm -hmm. uh, uh, roughly around the range? They have a range. Uh, I think their average is like twenty two hundred. Don't quote me on that. Um, they definitely look at like your like school too and like uh, from what I've read, I think. My score is among like one of the higher scores. Yeah. Like, don't stress too much about your SAT score. Honestly, like, I think it probably helped me in getting in, but it's like, prep for it and like, um, yeah, don't worry too much about it. Like, I think if you like reach a certain like threshold score, mm -hmm. they don't really care about SAT beyond that. So. Okay. I don't know yeah. if you have other slides talking about how the Pomona uh, their their um, their requirements. Like, your SAT is pretty high, but for some kids, their SAT is only two. 2200. Oh, that's, that's, fine. that's fine. Yeah, that's fine. but uh, what about other things they, they actually look into so that the kids can go into the Pomona? You know? uh, I think the SAT is not Ask for the, the uh, admission officer the same question. Uh, he said that the score is not the score, but the score is the score. They look at the reading very important. The reading is not the score. The score is the score. The score is the score. The score is the score. 我的意思是说 ICT is not that high, say 2200, hers is very very high, okay, almost right up. But for, for, for the kids, their ICT is not that high, and what other things they need to prepare so that they recover the low ICT. Mm -hmm. oh. Okay, yeah. yeah. I guess I do talk about that a little bit that would be great. for a section. Pomona yeah, sure. is a very, very holistic school, like mm -hmm. a lot of liberal arts colleges are that way, so they really focus on your essays and your interviews. And your teacher recs and your extracurriculars. They look at like the whole package. Yeah, so yeah, that's yeah. 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 I know, I know, I understand, but I just want to know. Okay. Okay. So I don't know. Yeah. So I don't know if this is a good time to ask a question, but like general uh, advice for people going to Pomona? To Pomona? Or to Little More Schools? General. I think I'll cover that later. Yeah. So uh, stay a little bit. Um Okay, so I guess we'll move on. Any other questions you can like save till the end? So, I'll introduce a couple of liberal arts colleges now. So these are the top, or not the top six like every year, but these are very highly ranked liberal arts colleges around the country. So 
Um, we have Williams College, which is consistently ranked in like the top five by Forbes. It's very excellent. Um, they're in Massachusetts, 2,000 students. They're known for their very excellent athletics and their good math, science, and econ program. They also have a tutorial program, which is borrowed from Oxford University in England, which is basically when you have like a professor and two or three other um, students having a one-on-one, -on -one, like or two two-on-one session, I guess. And um, from freshman year, they have that, so it's a very personalized experience. Uh, we have Amherst, also in Massachusetts, 1,700 students or 1,800 students. They're known for their humanities and arts and English program. They're very strong in humanities. And of course, they have really strong science programs. Too. And they're also part of a consortium, which means that there's five schools nearby that you can like interchange courses with. I'll talk a little bit about like consortium later. But Pomona, which is my school, um, they're in California, Southern California, um, 1,600 students. They're known for, OK, they're known for, like I think, general. I'll talk a bit more about Pomona in the next slide. But they're known for. Um, I think overall, like uh, humanities and science, are both very strong at. Um, Carleton, Minnesota, um, 2,000 students. They're known for their st excellent like um, STEM program. Their biology, chemistry, is really strong. Uh, also, really friendly students apparently. So that's a pretty great school. Um, Fort Moore is in Pennsylvania near Philadelphia. 1,500 students. They're known for their engineering program, which is pretty rare in the Lawrence colleges, but you do find those. And they also have really intense academics uh, compared to a lot of other liberal arts colleges too. They're known for that. And their are honors thesis program. So they have a really uh, specialized honors track for people who are looking into that too. And finally, Middlebury in Vermont, uh, 2,500 students. They're known for their languages program. They're really strong in English and foreign languages. Um, they're also very environment, environmentally concerned and they have pretty good science programs too. So which school actually you think is um, most competitive? What about the Cal 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 Carlton College? Carlton? Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. Most competitive? Do you think it's, very, uh, it's the same competitive as Pomona? Yes. Or their admissions rate might be different, but all these are consistently ranked like among the top 10 liberal arts colleges, I think. Yeah. Um, I actually have a question for it because like for a lot of the Claremont colleges, they are really strong in like English or um, like politics, for example. Mm -hmm. But um, before you were mentioning how the professors put a lot of weight on teaching rather than research. Yeah. But in like a major such as bio or chem, if you want to go to grad for med school, where research up, where like research experience is really like important. Um, mm -hmm. How would you say the experience? I think for Pomona, actually, I'm not. I can't say for all the colleges. Pomona uh, is really good at giving you research opportunities because even though like you don't have as like broad a spectrum necessarily, the teachers like are really um, involved in making sure like you get a research like research opportunity while you're Wait, there. So you so have to go out there and ask the professor. Yeah, you do. Okay. So I had a um, on my tour in April. Uh, the person who was like leading the tour, she's a I think molecular bio major, and she was like uh, my freshman year. I was just talking to a professor about research, and like the professor was like, "Yeah, you should just come like in the summer and like intern for me." And like, so it's like, it's really casual in the, their interactions, and like it's really easy to get an opportunity. So, yeah. So, did you also try to attend some comprehensive universities or just the uh, liberal arts? Oh, I'll talk about what I applied to like right after this. So, yeah. Um, so next. Uh, this is the Claremont College Consortium, which is the consortium my school is part of. Um, they're all in Claremont, California. They have a total population of about 6,300 students. It's kind of like a mid-sized university. Like a lot of Ivy League universities are about 6,000 students. And they have over 2,000 courses. So interesting, like the best thing I think about like consortium um, atmosphere is that you can like take any course at any college you want within the consortium. Um, so you're like not limited by your own college majors or courses. So we have Claremont McKenna, which is 9.76 assessments rate this year, which is the same as Pomona, the exact same as Pomona, actually. Their focus is political science, um, international relations, econ, and they have a special major called PPE, which is politics, philosophy, and economics. And that's really popular with their students. They're very business focused and business oriented. Um, Pomona, which is um, 9.76 this year as well, they're focused on they don't have one main focus, I think. They're like um, they're generally very strong in the humanities and like social and natural sciences. 
they have really strong departments in cognitive science. Uh, they have a really great linguistics and um, cognitive science program. They have they're really good at psychology, philosophy, econ, neuroscience, math, CS. They have like they're just generally like um, pretty strong. Uh, we have Harvey Mudd down there, which is um, acceptance rate of 12.7 this year. Um, Harvey Mudd, oh, acceptance rate is 12.7 this year. And they're unique in that they're an engineering liberal arts school. Uh, a couple of other liberal arts colleges also have engineering majors, but Harvey Mudd is all like um, STEM. It's completely STEM. Uh, they have, you have to be a STEM major in order to um, apply. And they have a really great engineering program. And they require, they also require one third of the students' classes to be in the humanities. So you have like a really strong grounding in um, like the humanities as well as like the STEM fields. So Harvey Mudd is pretty cool. Is that where you want to take your um, I'm currently considering that, but uh, it's kind of difficult to transfer between Pomona and Harvey Mudd's si computer science department. And some people do that, but it's kind of difficult to like um, fulfill all your requirements like in the Harvey Mudd track. So it, it depends on a student, like depends on a major too. So yeah, Harvey Mudd's um, computer science classes are really, really, really good. I heard. So um, scripts, which is um, accepted at twenty-eight percent. They're a women's college, and their focus is on social science, cultural studies, and uh, interdisciplinary humanities, so they're very humanities-based. But even if you go to Scripps, you can still major at a college like your, doesn't, your college doesn't offer. Like, I have a friend who goes to Scripps, and she majors in cognitive science and linguistics, which actually isn't offered at Scripps. So she takes most of her classes at Pomona, actually. So Scripps is fairly, like, a lot easier to get into, but you can still have it, like, you can still take college, like, classes at different colleges within the consortium. That's a pretty cool aspect of, um... So, so in that uh, case, uh, why does she, like, uh, transfer, consider to transfer to? Because it's really difficult to transfer. Oh. <laughs> yeah, Pomona's a really difficult school to get into. Yes. And she's also limited. Like, it's easier for Pomona students to register for Pomona classes than to register for other classes. So, like, Scripps students would have a difficult time registering for, like, Pomona classes, oh. relatively. So, you get an advantage. Nice. Yeah. And finally, Pitzer, which is 12.9% at Pitzer this year. And their focus is on environmental activism, social justice, media studies, and social and behavioral science. So, they're very, like, environmental and, like, social justice. Yeah. For the, uh, for Hummingbird, I know they have, a, like, a core curriculum. You have to cover um, the general engineering, all the... Uh, yeah. like uh, chemistry, biology, and, um, and physics. And for the Promona, what is the code, the code program? Or we don't actually have like a series of classes you have to take. You have a, we have an area, like an area studies um, like requirement, I guess, which means you have to take one class in the area of like social sciences, mm -hmm. one class in the area of mathematical logic, one class in um, natural sciences, so like chem, bio, physics, whatever, one class in what else is there? Like a uh, history, I think, and one class is in like arts and languages. So you have to take six classes. So there's six area requirements total. So there's no like series of core classes you have to take. Yeah. Any other questions? So this is these are the schools I applied to this year. Um, most of them are liberal arts colleges, uh, and I also applied to a couple universities just because I was. Yeah, just um, get a, like more diversity in my college application process, I guess. Um, Pomona, Swarthmore, Amherst, and Carleton were like just my target schools, I guess. Um, St. Olaf, Wheaton, and Puget Sound were like more safety schools. I don't know if I got into any of these schools except for Pomona because I withdrew all my applications after I got in because that's what you're supposed to do. Um, except for I know I got a really big scholarship to St. Olaf and Puget Sound, but yeah. And I also applied to Brown, Carnegie Mellon. Rice and UCLA, especially because, like, especially UCLA was because they had a really good linguistics program, and I just tried that just because. And Carnegie Mellon had a uh, major I liked too, but most I really I was really into the idea of liberal arts colleges, so I really focused on that in my liberal or, uh, my um, application process. Which one is so, for ED? ED, uh, Pomona. Actually, I ED one to Brown, but I'm not sure if I got in because I never got the res final result. So, yeah. Yeah, ED1 was brown, ED2 was Pomona, so I never, yeah. So you said you preferred to teach people on the Why? 
Why? In comparison to folks on told beans as well. Um, well, I think that's a, uh, that's, there's a lot of reasons, um, but uh, I really like enjoy the small school environment and like the like student professor interaction, like the and like the fact that there's no like really huge lecture introductory classes. Like at Kings. Like at Kings, I really I think that the Kings environment really helped me develop as a person. So yeah. Oh, which one did you eat again? Pomona. Okay. But okay. I eat. So I'll tell you. Yeah, I eat one to brown actually. I eat two to Pomona. Okay. I was deferred from brown, so I'm not sure if I got invention or not. Pomona was eating two. Yeah. Is it okay for you? Uh, ED1 is, um, a lo mo I think most schools offer ED1. Uh, Pomona also offers ED2, which means that you can, if you don't get an ED1, if you got like deferred or something, you can also apply ED to another school. And after you get into, if you get into that school, you have to cancel all the rest of your applications. Do you do the same time or? Do Different times. Brown was one, which means you submit your application in November, I think. And then Pomona was uh, ED2, so you submit your application the same time as you submit your other applications on January 1st. And they consider your um, application earlier, like in February, and they give you a result in February. So, yeah. Do you know the ED2 for Pomona, the admission rate, acceptance rate is higher? How much higher? Oh, okay. Uh, they actually published, I think. I'm not sure the exact number, but it was something like, I think, 15, 16%. So it was a little bit higher than um, the overall. But I think it's a self-selective pool too. Like people who apply early know that they really want to go and know that they really like fit to that school. So, so, so you have better chance than ED one than ED two. Right? Um, I would no. For the uh, what I know, Hummingbird is almost the same. For the ED one, uh, ED and uh, regular, it's only like a five five percent difference. Actually, two. So ED two to no, they only count ED, and it's a eighteen percent acceptance rate for uh, ED. 13% for regular. No, no. 13% is ED. 8% is regular. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. 13 and 18. <laughs> oh. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, what uh, I remember is in yeah. the information session, they say they know some people not choose um, promote uh, Hamimad as a uh, the dream school. So they they prefer waiting for the regular one to get more people. So they didn't give the very high um, uh, uh, preference to uh, ED. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so, it depends, it depends on the school. Mm -hmm. So, uh, mm -hmm. the Am Amherst, uh, what mm -hmm. do you think Amherst compared to a Pomona? The so chances, why? Chances. Oh, yeah. Chances. Mm -hmm. You mean like the, if it's higher chance? Well, why don't you put an ED to uh, Amherst? Amherst. Yeah. Oh, okay. Well, Pomona, I really like the school culture, I guess, because I visited twice. Mm -hmm and I uh, had a really great experience most times. And Amherst doesn't have my major that I intended, which was like uh, linguistics, I mean. Okay. Yeah, Swarthmore did, but Swarthmore was kind of in Pennsylvania. I like, I like, what so. What yeah. about Carleton? Carleton, um, Carleton also had linguistics. Carleton's in Minnesota. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think I like the school culture from one better because there's a lot more like diversity. I think, um, I think Carleton's pretty white, but yeah. <laughs> I mean, they all have like their own like um, unique like attributes and like good things about things. So mm -hmm. yeah. How do you like Um, I didn't visit. I'm not really sure, but uh, they had a major I was interested in, which is like I think logic and like language or something like that. Um, it's a really great school. Yeah, I have a friend who got in that. It's going right now, but yeah. So do you think uh, you you tour the school twice? Do you think? Uh, the more you tour the school that you have record, they'll give you a preference? Uh, no, no. <laughs> no, no. Oh, you tour school, you school, you maybe more serious. No, no, no. You school, you can go No. I mean, they, they, yeah, I don't think they consider interest, especially these, like, really high making schools they don't really, yeah. This is a prospect of the Corona school scholarship, so, you know, what's the possibility of that scholarship, or what is the perspective of scholarship? What's, what do you think, how much do you think? Scholarship for Pomona? Yeah, for Pomona. Um, Pomona doesn't offer merit scholarships. Like some school, like if you like you have really high grades or you write really great essays, they give you money for that. Pomona only offers financial aid scholarships. So if your family like is um, lower earning, they like give you money for that. They evaluate that on a need base, like, um, but like they don't really offer merit scholarships. So what's the need base? You have to submit like a FAFSA, which is like you have to like talk about all your. Um, I think investments and your like income and all that. So you have like you have to 
say how much your family earns, and they give you depend they give you money depending on that. So they don't have merit based stuff going up. They're pretty generous, I think. Someone got to be the star. Uh, someone got to be the commentator. Uh, Mona. Uh, people. I mean. Um, yeah, how much they can get? Some people are full ride, actually. Yeah. It depends on the family situation. So. What was the most? Most? The most you can get is full ride. So like, but I think, I don't think anybody like sitting here could probably get full ride, yeah. but like it depends. Like, like if you're like really, um, you're part of like, I think Questbridge and you're like um, really, really low income, like really low income, you might be able to get a full ride to Pomona. Like a lot of people at Pomona actually have that. Like, so you don't pay anything at all. What is your major in? Uh, you don't actually have to declare it till sophomore year, but I put, um, Linguistics and computer science or English. Is so, major or no? oh, I'm not sure. There's like three possibilities. They want you to like declare an interest in certain majors, mm -hmm. but you don't have to like be set on that until. So you're you're declared right now. Yeah, I guess. Yeah, technically. But linguistics and the computer science are like this. They're very different. Yeah. They, they are very different. But so um. Why? Why do you make that? Um, I guess like they have you declare an interest. You don't have to say that I want this major right now. And since I really like like I like math, both math and um, the humanities, so I wanted to express that interest that I could possibly go into linguistics or possibly go into computer science or even go into English, even though computer and science and English are so different. So I wanted I wanted to show like I had interest in all of these. But I'm not sure exactly what I'm doing. Those three courses are very different. So how do you manage to to take? You know, to satisfy all of the three majors. Uh, they're very different. Yes, ones. yes. But um, I don't have to s declare that like, these aren't my like set majors right now, and um, I, I don't think I'll triple major. <laughs> That's a bit too much. No, I mean, but does yeah. the uh, how 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 does the uh, how does Pomona provide you? Okay, you because you s select those three majors, and then you have to set. Yeah, you have to take no, such only such one major, major so that you, you have to, you know. Promona only, so so only so have so one so major. You cannot have those uh, three majors. Oh, I don't have to do provide you the courses you need to take for the first year. Yeah, I mean, I could take courses, like my freshman year, I don't have to take courses in these majors I declare necessarily, oh, actually. Okay. Oh. So they talk to you once you're there and they give you a better idea of that. Yeah. Oh. Like for example, I suddenly decided I don't even want to take any English classes at all. I can just like get rid of that. So they don't really care about that. Mm -hmm. lose. Actually, you are good at maths, you are good at linguistics, you do major in computer science, you should consider just a suggestion <laughs> <laughs> and consider natural language. Yeah, processes. I listened to that actually. That's what the computational linguistics Olympiad is about, like natural language processing. So I'm, I don't know, I'm considering that they have classes in that if I wanted to. And some of the new techniques uses what's called the neural networks that's very relevant to mathematics. Yeah, yeah, it's really good. Mm -hmm. yeah, I noticed that you applied to more than half of the liberal arts college in St. Williams. Oh, yeah, good, good observation. <laughs> um, well, I think Williams, uh, I, I didn't really like Williams very much because like they have a, um, well, I don't know, personally, it's just for me, like they, they were like more like I, I read that they have a more like sort of frat boy like uh, athletic -y culture and I wasn't really into that but I mean like you can't like generalize that much but I just I don't think they had my major either but it was I didn't like the things I read about their culture online so yeah. So do you know about uh, even the if you, you take computer science do, do they offer BS degree or BA degree? Oh um Offer like I'm not entirely sure about that. Yeah, I'll let them back to me. Yeah. Um, so do people usually have prom getting into their majors? They don't have to declare to a sophomore year, right? So are certain majors harder to get in, or no? I'm pretty sure you can get in any major you want to want. Computer science is pretty competitive, but it's, I think everyone who like really wants that can get that. Yeah. Promona College, when you apply, how many essays have to, the supplement essay have to write? Oh, just one, which I'll address later. It's a really cool essay. So, yeah. <coughs> All right. Oh, do you oh. Uh, submit a uh, art supplement? I do. Yeah. My friend who got to Mona did. She was a pianist. 
just like me, but she had a really hard, long part to commit. Uh, so part three, looking for looking towards the future. How do LA grads get a job? So uh, first of all, I think that um, like when you're out of college, you can either think about going to graduate school or you can think about like getting a job right away. Uh, if you're thinking about going to grad school, um, liberal arts college is actually really great for uh, getting uh, going into grad school. So uh, Wall Street Journal published a study of, of the top 50 feeder schools to these graduate institutions. So they asked these following institutions, Columbia Medicine Law, Harvard Medicine Law, Business, um, JHU Medicine, UCSF Medicine, Yale Medicine and Law, U Chicago Law Medicine, uh, Law and MBA, and UPenn Wharton. So the top 50 feeder schools are like the people who contributed most of their um, like uh, students to these um, graduate schools. So out of the top 50 graduate theater schools, the following, the previous institutions, um, to the 22 of them were liberal arts colleges. And I think Williams College was number five, and um, Williams outperformed Duke, Dartmouth, MIT, Columbia, Brown, UPenn, Georgetown, in terms of their grad school attendances. And a lot of uh, liberal arts colleges, like Williams, Amherst, Swarthmore, Pomona, and Wellesley, outranked a bunch of Ivy League schools, like um, UPenn, Columbia, Brown, like in terms of how many students the grad school programs actually accepted. So, uh, especially I think because of like the really close like uh, teacher-student interactions, like for teacher recs, and also the research opportunities um, you have, you can also have at liberal arts colleges. Uh, it's actually really great for applying to um, graduate school if you're looking at that. All right. So this graph is basically. Um, uh, so Williams College did a study of all their where their grads went after they graduated for 50 years. So this is a study of 1,500 or 15,000 um, Williams graduates and where they got uh, jobs. So if you'll see on this side, the uh, uh, right your left side, these are all the majors. So they have like art, music, linguistics, English lit, philosophy, culture studies, history, political studies, and so on. Uh, on this side are um, job categories like law, sales, consulting, banking, um, technology, college education, whatever. And so people like who graduated from each of these major fields can get jobs in like any sort of these um, job fields. So I think it just goes to show that like a liberal arts education prepares you for like many different fields of work. You don't have to be concerned about your major so much like because uh, like they prepare you for like your um, overall. I mean of course like major still important but it gives you like a better grounding like of to get jobs in like any field later. So yeah. And I think this link is just uh it's from Pomona actually. Oh, here it is. Um so this is from their